Okay, well thank you for coming. We're going to have another wonderful afternoon. We put on the flyer 1 to 3.30, although uh, Peter says we have the house for the afternoon and we just have maybe a, a dinner and a, and a flight. Uh, we have to get to the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. But uh, yeah, so there's no real specific end time here, so if it gets to be 3.30 or even before you have to go, you can do the old smile and wave thing and we'll keep on going and then we'll just wrap up when we wrap up. And uh, I'm sure this will be a very uh, deep, intimate time together. And Stephanie was just sharing with us, she was here yesterday too, and there's just been a lot of emotions coming and she was just saying, I wish I could just take you home and ask you lots and lots and lots of questions. <laughs> ah, here we go. No more. We're just getting ready to start. <laughs> Good timing. So, uh, yeah, that's something that we like to do. In fact, it's, it's one question is everyone's question, then that's just a very good use of time. So, you've got us while we're, we're here, so we pull up a chair nice and close. Maybe we can get the microphone and Stephanie can just share what's on her mind. Yeah, I actually started noticing something yesterday um, that when you were answering the question about death, um, somebody asked the question, well, all these questions start happening in my head, and then somebody said, started talking about near-death experience, and I thought, wait a minute, I was just thinking that question. And then Hope was next to me, and she asked about Jesus being alive. And I, had, I was just thinking that. And so something started happening in me. It's like, is somebody reading my mind? Am I reading somebody else's mind? Or are we just all connected and we all have the same questions? Like, my mind just started, like, racing. And, like, and so all these questions started coming up. Of, like, you mentioned something yesterday about, like, choosing um, to be sick. Well, um, I have these symptoms that come up from time to time, and actually I'm in a lot of pain today, but if somebody sees me, they will never guess I'm in a lot of pain because I will just put a smile on and just go on with my life. That's just how I am. And, and it, yesterday when I saw my son come into the kitchen, I just started crying because I was like, I just don't want to leave my son. I don't go to the doctor because I'm afraid of doctors. I'm afraid of hearing you have cancer. I'm afraid I'm going to die. I'm afraid. I have all these fears just constantly coming up around death. And I don't know how I'm choosing to be sick. I don't know why I'm choosing to be sick. My life just feels so empty. You met my husband. You know he's a wonderful man. And when I met you, you knew we were going through it. And I have two adorable kids. And I have a perfect job. And but my life feels so empty. Last night when I was asking myself, like, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I in so much pain? And as I was falling asleep, I saw the face of the little boy, and I just heard, because you're not following your passion. And I woke up, and I was like, what? Like, did I just make that up? Did I, did that really happen? Am I just, am I going crazy? Like, all this, like, I just don't know. I'm lost. I really feel lost. I guess I'm just emotional. Everything is coming up right now. Like, oh, I think I'll still have hope. I have a good friend. I had a friend. And she's a spiritual path. And, and I feel like she stopped talking to me because I wouldn't leave my husband. I'm just not ready. I just... I don't have very many friends. I don't. I don't go out much. I, 
I'm just lost. And my life feels empty. And, but in my heart, I feel like only one God. That's good. That's good. Let's just start from that. Because, um, yeah, God hears the prayer of the heart before we even speak a word. We don't even have to say a word. God knows the prayer of the heart. It's interesting, uh, right before I came to this gathering, right before I got in the, the car uh, with Peter, I was guided to send you a, an audio recording. And I was awakened at 2, 2.30 in the morning, and I was... A friend of mine who was speaking on the audio tape, she texted me, oh, I did an ECAM interview, and then five or ten minutes later, I found it online, not even searching for it, it just kind of appeared in my news feed, and I went, oh, this is the interview on ACI Gather, and it was right there, and then I listened to it for about 52 minutes. Interesting, um, she talked about her spiritual journey. She's not, of course, a miracle student. She just talked about her spiritual awakening journey. How conflictual it's been, because she's kind of got, like, people believe they've got a life going on in the world, the circumstances in the world, and then there's this huge pull, she called. We actually talked on the, on the Skype today from South Africa. And I sent you that video just because it was guided to do it, but it's interesting that she was married, her first husband died of cancer, and then she got married again, and she had two boys, two children. And it was with these young children when she started to have these very deep, profound experiences, like this huge call started happening. And, you know, her greatest fears were she would just see her, her children, and she would just go, I'm not ready. Like, I, I want God, I want Spirit. I, I want, I know there's more, and I want what, you know, she didn't use the years over God. I, I know there's more, and I want that. But there was many, many fears that came up, and then she actually started to get very strong promptings to take a trip to Peru, from South Africa, and then um, had powerful experiences there, powerful experiences in Hawaii. She started to go as interdirected and had all these experiences, and would, was away from her children for quite a bit of the time, so that she would have to wait for this tiny little window when they would be up, just to talk to her two young children. And she described things in great detail, but she also reached a point where even her children started to reflect what was going on in her heart. Like her little boy, David, uh, saying to her, Mommy, you have to follow your heart. As she would have conflictual thoughts. It would start even reflecting back um, through the children. And so I feel like that, that will be very, very helpful. Because it's all we have on planet Earth is the context of what seems to be our life on Earth, which seems to start with birth and end with death. But this is a tiny band of time. I, re I remember reading that Helen Schuckman uh, one time uh, was taken on this adventure. It's like, like Jesus took her, almost like Superman taking Lois Lane, and they went flying together. And they were flying along. And as they were flying, Helen looked over and happened to notice, just happened to glance and notice the entire lifetime of Helen Shuckman as they were flying by. She barely had time to notice them. Hey, hey! You know, and, and it was such a tiny blood. It was almost like what we consider a long lifetime with all the things we go through in a human lifetime from birth to death. And it was this tiniest little blip <laughs> that she almost missed it. She almost missed the entire life of Helen Shuckman. They were flying by so fast. And that's a very different perspective, you know, from the ego's perspective, the life, life of the body, the, he says, the serial adventures of the hero of the dream. He calls, 
Jesus is poking fun at the body, at personhood, and he's poking fun in one of his subsections. He's calling it the hero of the dream, the serial adventures of the hero of the dream, the serial adventures of the body. And, you know, just that's a whole different context. Uh, he says, the world you seem to live in is not home to you. Uh, he goes on at one point to say, the real world is nothing like the world you live in. There are no shops and stores where you go to buy things that you don't even need and don't even want, and spend end time doing endless things. He starts to poke fun at jobs, doing endless things, meaningless things, so that you can get more money to go to more shops and buy more things that you don't even need or want. You know, it's, it's almost like he's saying, everything you believe in, everything involving your life on earth is, is a parody. You know, if you, if you want to make the angels laugh, you don't need Eddie Murphy or a stand-up comedian. <laughs> the human condition, what humans do every day, sends the angels into a laugh-a-thon. They just roar at the things that humans do, because, because they're so misguided, but because they also have the awareness of awe, it's cute, they don't know any better. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. That, that everything we consider important in this world, and I think that's, those will be the biggest struggles on the spiritual journey, is when you start to get this strong calling, it's almost like there's some kind of a spiritual light or tractor beam, to use a, uh, a Star Trek analogy, that we're supposed to get on the spot, like remember the the thing that tra teleporter. We're supposed to be teleporter. We're supposed to get beamed back to heaven, and yet we run around avoiding the teleporter. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, so step inside the chamber, stand still, and it's beam me up, Scotty. You know, it's that's the thing. But we we avoid the teleporter because of the belief in sacrifice. So the way it is set up is that this world is a projection, it really has no substance, it's like a mirage. Like if you were in the desert and you were walking along and thirsty and hot and you had a mirage of an oasis, it would be like wish fulfillment. That's what this world is. Just like nighttime dreams, we were talking about those yesterday, they're really no different than our daytime experiences, or our fantasies, or our daydreams, they're all, they're all dreams. And Freud didn't have a lot of things right, but one of the things Freud got right, we'll give him credit. <laughs> All right, Sigmund, we're going we're to throw you in here. You had a lot wrong, but we'll give you one thing. You said dreams are wish fulfillment, and dreams are wish fulfillment. The, the experiences we experience during our daily life, during our nighttime dreams, nighttime nightmares, terrors, fantasies, even our juicy fantasies, all the daydreams, they're all dreams. They're all the fabric of dreams. Sweet dreams are made of this. <laughs> Who am I to disagree? Travel the world and the seven seas. Everybody's looking for something. It's wish fulfillment. Everything that we experience, from your your children, to your husband, to this Unity Church <laughs> in Arlington, to all the people in the church, to the trees, the planets, the stars, the cars I see driving by, the fishies in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me. Everything we experience is dreams. And then you get this call inside that's like saying, come home, come home. This world is, that you seem to live in is not your home, come home. It's calling us to a state of mind. And it's just like in The Wizard of Oz, you know, where Dorothy has homesickness for Kansas. She really wants to be with all of her loved ones, she wants to go back. And it's, she wants to get, get out of this strange dream where there's a, a witch with, green face and a long nose and a wicked sounding voice, 
and flying monkeys that come down and snatch you and take you up into the air to the witch, and all kinds of things in this this land called Oz that she doesn't understand. Sounds a bit like Alice, down the looking glass. Everything is distorted. Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Down the rabbit hole, where everything's distorted. So when you become accustomed to the distorted world, when you become accustomed to those seconds, and minutes, and hours, and days, and weeks, and months, when you become accustomed to those familiar faces of family, of children, of friends, of neighbors, whatever, when you become accustomed and you think that your feet are firmly planted on a solid base called Earth, through what we're told is gravity, holding us so we don't all go floating, floating off, when you become so accustomed to these things, when you expect them, when you wake up in the morning you don't wonder if you're going to float away, you expect you're going to step out of that bed and step onto some solid ground. This isn't like an LSD acid trip, you know, this is the stability of what we think is the world. You have to realize that, that if you believe that you're living in a reality called time and space on earth, that you are twice removed from reality that you've first forgotten that you're dreaming, and you have forgotten also that you're the dreamer of the dream, and you take the world that's presented to you through the five senses as being reality. And you act and react upon the sights and sounds and smells and tastes and touches that you have through those five senses. I remember when I was talking to Jesus, because I had a really good connection with Jesus, and I would I would ask him things like, what about the five senses, you know, is there, is there anything that the five senses can show me that, that they have any relation, is there anything, that there have any semblance of likeness to eternity? And he said, no. These are images, these are, this is idolatry, you are, you are smack dead in the middle of idolatry, remember from the Bible? Hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. In Bible school, I was thinking, okay, I'm not going to make any totem poles. You, you, you definitely won't see me making any golden totem poles uh, in my life. I was named after David in the Bible, King David in the Bible. So you're not going to see me making any golden totem poles, because that's the Old Testament and you know the Ten Commandments and no graven images. Well, the whole cosmos, that's the graven images. Everything that we perceive through the five senses are the graven images. And, the, and the, the teaching was, hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. So, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I do remember reading in the Beyond All Idols section of A Course in Miracles, where there's one sense that really got me. God knows not form. Hmm. Hold no graven images before the Lord thy God, God knows not form, okay, I'm starting to get a little clearer idea here. From the Psalms of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What a way to start a song, the Lord is my shepherd, because we seem to be in the realm of wanting. We seem to be in the realm of desires. I call it distractionville. That's my synonym for the cosmos, destruction though. We seem to have so many wants, and then we have a beautiful blazing light like Jesus that comes along and says, let thine eye be single. Hmm, single. That sounds a lot different from multiplicity. Single? He doesn't say, let thine eye be multiple. <laughs> he says, let thine eye be single. He's talking about unifying perception. We are being called to forgive. We're being called into wholeness. We're being called into completion. We're being called into agape, unconditional love. We're being called into being a living demonstration of the living God, whole and complete, holy, pure. We're being called into let that I be single, to let 
our desires become unified. I wondered, I said, hmm, I like to use the Course as an oracle. I said to Jesus, can you give me an example from the Course of Let Thine Eye Be Single? Is there a passage in the Course? I open it up. The peace of God is my one goal, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose, and my function, and my life, while I abide where I am not at home. That's a let thine eye be single passage. Anything else? Any other goodies? Let thine eye be single? Can you make it get a little clearer? Well, he said, I'll, I told you about the lilies of the field a couple thousand years ago, in those red words in the Bible, but he said, here's one for you. Once you have accepted his plan as the one function that you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you. Without your effort, he will go before you, making straight your path and leading in your way. No stones to trip on and no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing except the only purpose that you would fulfill. Let thine eye be single. In a world of multiplicity, in a world of multiple desires, can it be that the truth is that simple? That if we have a unified prayer, a unified desire, that we will wake up to eternity? That's exactly what we're called to. And what you're bringing up, and the fears, and the tears, and the emotions are when the call comes, when the call starts to arise, then there's something in us that is afraid. There's something in us that rears its head. It's like, whoa. There's something in us that's like, ooh, this is going to cost something very dear. Remember all those passages in the Bible about Cain and Abel and all those stories we read about from the Old Testament? Almost like sacrificing a child and, you know, pretty, help, help me interpret this stuff again. It seems pretty intense. Basically, everything that was made in form, all time and space, was a substitute reality. And even the New Age teachings that say you can create your own reality, meaning you can manifest any kind of world that you want, is still part of the ego's plan. Still using the power of the mind to manifest anything that you want. Of course, it seems to be that that's the way it goes, but, but who says you know what you want? <laughs> Remember the song by Bob Skaggs? You can't get what you want till you know what you want. Isn't that profound? You can't get what you want till you know what you want. So if you don't know what you want and you've got a powerful mind, you're just going to draw forth conflicting circumstances, conflicting wishes, a conflicting world. And then the ego is going to say, well, this conflicted world is better than nothing. Are you going to let go of this conflicted world for the big question mark? For the big unknown? Oh, it may be heartbreaking this world, but at least it's familiar. You may have pain and suffering and misery, but at least it's a familiar pain, familiar suffering, Familiar misery. You see how the ego is going to have you clutch on to the world that it made. Because it's saying, don't go back to God. You don't know what you're going to get. You've forgotten God anyway, so how do you know that if you remember God, that God's not going to be mad at you? The ego says, you did pull your mind away from God. You don't think it's going to be scot-free. Oh, welcome you back. No penalty. No problem. Come on. Oh, wait a minute, that's the prodigal son story. Jesus told that story. Actually said yes. <laughs> that was the answer to the ego, to Satan. Oh yes, 
the father will come running down the road, will throw the robe around you, will have a feast in your honor, even if you squandered your inheritance, you believe you have, even if you're out feeding the pigs, and you don't even have enough food to eat, even the pigs have the food, but you don't have enough to eat, you could still turn back to God, and God will come rushing to meet you, no matter what you seem to do wrong, it will have no impact whatsoever on God's love for you. Interesting that Jesus told that parable over and over and over. It must have been important for Jesus to keep repeating himself on that particular parable. That's probably one of the most famous parable from the Bible, is the parable of the prodigal son. So what I feel is happening is, is there's an activation happening, and there's, there is a call that's coming, and there's a part of your mind that actually knows that it is an authentic call inside, and then there's also a part that goes, my, my world is empty without you, babe. You know, it's, we know when we're feeling feelings of emptiness, like, what's the point? You know, it's like that Beatles song, du, 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 it's just another day, du, 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 du. you know, it's that repetitive day, where we're going through the day, and we're thinking, there's got to be more than this. I don't know what it is. I have a hunch that there's much more than meets the eye, that there's a destiny, that my soul has a destiny, and that that destiny will be fulfilled through joy. I will have, I would have more and more ascending steps of joy, and more intense joy as I go towards this ultimate joy. The world is not escaped through fear. No one goes to heaven through death. No one goes to heaven through guilt or shame or pain. And let's talk a little bit about pain, because you brought that up. I was saying in sickness, is a wrong-minded decision, and that much of the wrong mind is unconscious. So, for human beings, they don't really get that, that, that sickness and pain is a choice. It seems like there's a lot of factors that the world would say, right away, the medical model will rush to diagnose something. It'll look in the brain scans, it'll look all through your body, it'll look at your environment, are you living by the love canal, are you... <laughs> what's happening around you to, to make you sick, because it's all an external looking, uh, the whole medical model is, is like among all the professions, that's just one among others that are looking external, like most sciences are as well. So basically, you're coming to a point of seeing, well, I have an opening here to answer a call. And in order to answer that call, I have to be willing to receive the instructions and receive the answers that will be given from that call. Because that's what it means to answer the call. It's not like we, we get just a big present with a shiny bow on it, we just have to open up the package. We give it, we're given instructions, little hunches, little nudges. Go here, go there, call somebody. You know, it's every day there's those little nudges. And we're aware of them, there's, there's some nudges in there, but also we can be heavily defended against these nudges. Because of one reason, the belief in sacrifice. Oftentimes people get into studying the Course, and they are happy to find a book that's telling them that God asks no sacrifice that sacrifice is an idea, a concept that is unknown to God. They're happy to read that. But they're also quick to point at the Catholics, and they're quick to point at the Baptists, and they're quick to point at many denominations of Christianity. Those poor people, they still believe in the blood of the Lamb. They still believe that God demanded the sacrifice of His beloved child, and Jesus had to pay the Sacrificial blood of the lamb cost, the ransom, ransom is the word they use, those poor fundamentalists, those poor Baptists, those poor, poor Catholics. Wait a minute, 
It's all one mind. If I'm still seeing people outside that believe in sacrifice, guess who believes in sacrifice? <laughs> oh boy! That's something to face. I love it when I go to New Unity's, New Thought Church. Oh, it's all love, it's all good, it's all oneness and everything, and this and this. But once we talk about sickness, suffering, pain, I don't know. I know where that comes from. God is love, it's all love, I don't know. Jesus was basically telling a sickness comes from guilt. And if we believe in sacrifice, if we have still buried guilt, then we do not know an experience of unconditional agape love. We're still facing the old theology. Remember that? Carry the old rugged cross <coughs> and sin, the wages of sin is death. Sin. Oh my God, I'm in a unity church and I use that word. Sin. <laughs> the walls are shaking. That's not new. That's not a new thought idea. Sin. Well, Jesus talks a lot about sin, actually, in A Course in Miracles. It's an error to be corrected, but it's still the same old error of, of sacrifice. When this world was made up, it was made up as a d defense mechanism against love. They tell me, and I've been told for years, love makes the world go round. It's actually guilt that spins this world. <laughs> guilt is behind gravity. Guilt is behind black holes and stardust and everything. This is a, a world made by guilt. Jesus even goes so far to say as the world was made in hatred. Oh, come on now, that's a little bit too harsh. Maybe we, we come on Jesus, we can... You can come up with a better word than hatred. The world was made in hatred, the body was made in hatred. You can come up, come on, give us something else. Oh, well, what's he say in the workbook? The world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God can enter not. Okay, got it. Got it. So if I'm going to wake up to the kingdom of heaven, if you know that form, if you're guiding me to let go and forgive illusions, and to come back to the truth, and accept the truth, then, then I must really need to be free of all attack thoughts, and all judgments, and all grievances in my mind. That fits with everything you've taught. That fits perfectly with the Sermon on the Mount, judge not, lest ye be judged. That fits absolutely perfect with everything that Jesus ever taught in the Bible. Jesus is basically saying, I'm calling you out of the world. Our kingdom, our home, is not of this world. God is an eternal creator and God creates with eternal creations. And everything of perception is a veil drawn over the truth. And when we come to answer the call, the biggest obstacle we're going to have to face is the belief in sacrifice. I, even when I watch political conventions for the years, I always like to just listen to the content of the talks at the political convention. And I love to live here, they get up and they go, we need to clean the rivers, we need to save planet Earth, we need to wipe away these crimes and all of this nuclear threat, we need to do all this, why? Because of the future, for our children, in the future. We can sacrifice right now for our f future children. I'm just listening to the word sacrifice. <laughs> it's like falling. Sounds good, good, good. Whoops! You lost me at the sacrifice word. <laughs> Sounds like that good old fashioned religion, you know. <laughs> Nails on the cross, blood. Sacrificial lamb. I hear that sacrifice word come out. Well, I'm going to exercise. I'm yeah, a little overweight, but I'm going to go to the gym and no pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. I'm going to have to sweat. I don't want to go to the gym, but I'm going to have to sweat. I'm going to have to sacrifice. I'd rather be home eating chocolate with hot chocolate and a 
smoothie chocolate on top of it, but I have to go to the gym and, and pedal and pump iron and work out. Got to sacrifice. Losing weight is described as a sacrifice. You see, it's pervasive. The belief is that you've got to give up something valuable to get something valuable. And the teaching of the Course in Miracles is you don't have to give up a thing to be who you are. You were created perfect, and you're still perfect. And you'll forever be perfect. You can make a case and say you're not perfect, but the higher court of the Holy Spirit will throw the case out. <laughs> will not even hear the case. <laughs> but, you say, do you know my life? Have you been watching this? <laughs> case dismissed. The gavel comes down, innocent, eternally innocent. That's the kind of God that we've got. And so the call is coming in, and, and the strain is just coming in of answering the call. Now, why would we have strain and resistance in answering the Holy Spirit's call? That's an interesting thing. If this is the call for eternal life, if this is the call to joy, if this is the call to happiness, if this is the call that tells you God's will for you is perfect happiness, why would we resist? Well, in 12-step terms, we're, we're addicted to the stinking thinking. There, if you talk to people who are in 12-step programs, they'll say, I first had to get in touch with my addiction to misery. It's interesting when I listen to people on 12-steps that have had alcoholic addictions, drug addictions, sex addictions, all kinds of struggles, They'll tell you, I couldn't even begin the healing process until I admitted that I had a problem and admitted that there was some kind of a strange, weird addiction to misery that was making me take that next drink, that was making me take that next joint or that next hit. There's some strange, twisted addiction to misery has to be faced. And everyone has to face that addiction to misery. How can we hope to be healed from pain and suffering in the mind if we're still holding it close and protecting it, if we still feel we like that misery, there's something safe about misery? How can we ever heal from misery for protecting the misery? So when that call comes in, to answer that call, we really have to be honest with ourselves of where am I in my mind? Where am I in my heart resisting the call? I have to get in touch with that uh, there's an actual terror at listening to the voice for God. Seven billion people, and if you talk to most of them, some of them believe in God, some of them are atheists, some of them are agnostic, some of them believe in pink pyramids, you know, <laughs> my gosh, they believe in all kinds of things. And, and when you talk about listening to the voice for God, there's not a lot of people that say they have conversations with Jesus. There are some that say they are Jesus, they are the second coming of Jesus, usually they're locked up uh, <laughs> in psychiatric institutions, and they're shot full of drugs, because judges, doctors don't like to hear that stuff. You go to your doctor, you say, I am the second coming of Christ, you know, I have a psychiatrist I can refer you to, you know, but nobody takes that seriously. I did get recent Facebook messages of somebody who worked with the Course for some years, and then I went over the top and said, I am the second coming of Christ, and it got worse <laughs> from there, the, the, the message got worse. When we are, are being called to accept that forgiveness, to go into that innocence, to accept ourselves as the living Christ, and to let go of the mask of persona that covers over that light, then that's what it's going to entail. Now, let's look a little bit at the fear, the fear of answering the call. Because it doesn't necessarily seem logical. If this is a call back to eternal love, then it doesn't seem logical to say no to it or to fight it. But the ego is terrified of that call. There is no ego in eternity. So basically, the ego is terrified of the call because it's out of business. 
And remember, the ego itself is just a belief, so the ego is more concerned about the mind that believes in it. Because the ego is like a parasite. The ego is like a parasite draining the mind of its creativity, of its joy, its happiness. When you feel fatigue, you feel the ego's fatigue. When you're tired, you feel the ego's sense of tiredness. Spirit isn't tired. Spirit is eternally loving, joyful, and vibrant. So when you even consider answering that call, the ego is going to go from suspicious to vicious. It's going to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, to say, think twice before you make that move. Why? Because the ego is threatened. If you start listening and following those guidances, the ego feels like its days are numbered. And that's true. If you start following the voice of the Holy Spirit, the ego's days are not only numbered, they are severely numbered. They are shortened by an amazing amount of time. That's what miracles do. They collapse time. They bring the Alpha and the Omega back together. They, they show you that I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It really, love has no start or stop. It's, it's just eternal. So, the ego will resist the call, and then when the ego, if you side with the ego and you say, hold on there, because I went through this in the parable of David, I started to get my call when I was in graduate school at the university. I had a scholarship, I had professors, I was in a so-called elite program where they only accepted very few people from around the United States. I think maybe there was like eight of us out of hundreds and hundreds of applicants. So I was tied into a, a scenario that was graduate school, elite program, professors, of course my parents were very happy, doing very well. Oh, an elite program? Very good. Scholarship? Good for us. We don't like to be paying those t tuition fees. A lot of kudos, a lot of praise. That's what I was dealing with. And then, in the middle of graduate school, I started to get my call. And Jesus is like, I'm calling you out of the world. I have a purpose for your life. It doesn't involve school. <laughs> <laughs> got to remember, I was probably in my ninth year of school, and, and moving on to my tenth year of, of, of um, university, and Jesus was like, There's, there are more important things than studying and projects and doing papers. <laughs> There's actually the salvation of the world <laughs> at hand here. <laughs> I need a little help. <laughs> You'll do fine. Well, part of my mind was going, can you pick another time? You, can you just wait till I get my degree? Maybe the, the children is always wait until the children are grown. I'll do fine when they're eighteen. I'll do fine when I've graduated. You know, you notice how you get into bargaining mode. <laughs> it's almost like you're saying to Jesus, "I know better than you <laughs> who to serve and when to serve." <laughs> so I'm going to give you some education, Jesus. <laughs> I'll tell you how things work on planet Earth. You wait till the children are 18 years. Let's throw in a few more years. I want to spend some time molly coddling them too. Let's say 21. I'm not going to fool with 18. I want to hang on, hang on, get some specialness out of there for another three years, and then maybe way in the future I'll serve you. And uh, I think you probably remember the Bible. You know, there's the story of the rich man. Does everyone remember the story of the rich man in the, the Gospels? The rich man came to Jesus and said, Lord, I have kept all the commandments. I, commandments. I have honored my father and mother. I have followed all the com your commandments. And now I would come and serve you. He says face to face to Jesus. This is in the, in the New Testament. And Jesus says, Go, sell all that you have, and follow me. And the man bowed his head, didn't answer Jesus, just turned and 
solemnly walked away. All Jesus said was one thing. Sell all that you have and follow me. And the rich man turned and did not answer Jesus. Jesus already knew. Jesus knew everything before it happened, so he was never surprised. The Holy Spirit put those words in his mouth because the Spirit knows our heart before we even speak a word. And he knew that that man was not ready. He still had too much faith in riches. He still had too many treasures on earth. And Jesus had already spoken, you know, don't store your treasures up on earth where dust and moth can rot. Store your treasures up in heaven. He was telling people, forgive. Follow my teachings in forgiveness. There was one time a, a man came to Jesus and said, I would follow you, Lord, but, it's always the but, I will follow you, Lord, but, my father just died in the next town and I have to go and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. That was eternal life speaking. Eternal life is right here for you right now. And you're talking about other towns? There are no other towns. You're talking about fathers? Who is my father, mother, sister, brother, but he that does the will of our Father in heaven? Is our father, mother, sister, brother. You don't see Jesus, those red words don't really talk about Mary much. You never see him in the middle of one of his talks about the kingdom of heaven. I say unto you, I am the way, the truth, the Mom! <laughs> Mom, what are you doing here? I'm sorry. I know I should have said, I know I should have told you. I, I'm sorry. Mom, I, this is important. I'm talking to, I'm speaking for God. <laughs> yes, I'll bring home a loaf of bread. <laughs> yes, all right, I'll bring home some wine. <laughs> Boy, but, gosh. What was that? I'm the way, I am the life, and the life. <laughs> so Mom, he didn't turn into a Monty Python, <laughs> Life of Brian skit. <laughs> that presence, those red words were never interrupted with the black. Except when the apostles would go, I don't know what you're talking about, Lord. Can you give me another, another example? Black, black letters. I and the Father are one. Red letters. Back to the red letters. Red letters. Eternity speaking. Eternity speaking. We're being called to the greatest calling, the greatest thing that could ever come to us. And there is a section back in the Manual for Teachers that says, what is the real meaning of sacrifice? And Jesus says in that section, you have been called by God. You have been called by God to the most holy function there is. Will you sacrifice the call? He's taking that sacrifice word, now he's talking about it, the giving up of what you want. You've got the world of everything the ego stands for, and you've got the call back to eternity. When that call comes to you, will you sacrifice that call? Will you say to Jesus, not quite ready yet, not good timing, Jesus, as if somehow you know better than the Lord of life about the timings. So that, basically that file that I sent you, was my friend speaking, it's basically a, a woman who's just called by spirit, and called, and called again, and called again, and she has to face, um, she's very successful, she's had a corporate job, she's had a husband who, who died of cancer, she had another husband, she's got two young children, and she gets called, and that's the, the file that I sent you right before I came over here to hear her, to hear what she faced, to hear what went on in her mind, and also to hear her experiences that came when, when she would even slightly say yes and go and follow what that call was telling her to do. She would have these vast experiences of oneness. You know, that's what we need to convince us 
that we're, that we're on the right path. We have a pathway of guilt and fear and shame, and we have a pathway of joy and miracles and love. It's a pathway that calls us to a very deep intimacy and a deep connection, and then there's this other pathway that, that says, you know, you, you better just settle for the status quo. You don't really know if there's anything more than the status quo. The status quo is what you can touch. It's like, it reminds me of an early, early Steve Martin movie called The Jerk. <laughs> where he's walking through this room and he goes, and I don't need anything. I don't, I don't need anything at all. Except, and he, <laughs> as he starts to walk through this room, he says, except, and he goes, I don't need anything at all. By the time he gets through this room, he has so many things. He's burdened down. <laughs> as he's saying in words, he doesn't need anything, and his hands are grabbing for anything he can get his hands on. You can, it's, why is it such a funny scene? Because it's, it's comedy of the contrast of what we say and what we mean. And I love how Jesus says that in the workbook. He says, to say the words, I want the peace of God, is nothing. But to mean them is everything. That's what we mean by follow your heart. That's what we mean by you have to mean it. And also the ego may come back and go, well, I don't know how this is going to go. Of course it doesn't. It's, it is death. It's a death wish. <laughs> Why would you turn to a death wish for advice <laughs> on how this is going to go? Wouldn't you rather take an adventure moment by moment with the Lord of life and follow that adventure of miracles instead of defending against it? There will be times where emotions will come up, but there will always be an answer. There will be times where you are called to speak, and they may even be some familiar kind of settings and surroundings, but the one who will be in you, that will wit be witnessing for you and going before you, will not be trapped in those familiar settings. I remember after I started following the call, and I was shy, I didn't like to travel, I didn't like to talk, I didn't like public appearances. Um, I was a wallflower <laughs> and in the parable of David. And then when I started traveling and, and doing these talks, I started going around the United States and Canada, like Peace Pilgrim, around and around, and then, and then uh, more and more travels, and then one time I was in my little peace house in Cincinnati in the 1990s, and my assistant said, oh, you have a, a speaking invitation. And I looked at the paper, and I said, there? It was the church that David had been raised in. Mm -hmm. David's traditional Christian <laughs> church. I was like, Oh, that's interesting. She said, yeah, you have an invitation. It was called Zion. Remember in, uh, in the Matrix? When the war is over, the party begins in Zion. <laughs> from the Matrix. But this was before the Matrix came out. And all I knew of Zion was, <laughs> that was the name of my parents' church. Or the church that I had been confirmed in. Zion United Church of Christ. Still with those teachings of sacrifice and sacrificial lamb and all this. So, unbeknownst to me that uh, they had changed many ministers and pastors that I had, since I had left to talk about the Course in Miracles and travel around the world, that there was a new minister there who had a very long, I think, I think he was in a near-death experience that lasted like nine or twelve hours, where he was taken through all these experiences and taken into the light, and came back after this long near-death experience where his, his intestines were being eaten away by acid. He was flown across from 
France to the United States, and he he was an atheist art professor, and after this huge near-death experience, he came out the other end and entered the seminary to immediately study in the seminary. And he wrote a book on his whole experience, and he started going around to NDE conferences all around, speaking. His wife was shocked when she first saw him after he came to. She thought it was a walk-in. She thought, uh, what did you do with my husband? <laughs> kind of a mean, arrogant son of a bitch. And then after this long near-death experience and all this time in the light, was like a little child, an atheist professor, entered the seminary, wrote the book, went, spoke at the conferences, went on Oprah Winfrey, for God's sake, Oprah Winfrey, he went in a new direction. This guy was now the minister at my parents' church. <laughs> I said, oh, is that a reflection of my mind or what? <laughs> That's nothing like when I left. <laughs> You see how everything's a reflection. We can't assume anything about that. We may think one of our closest friends is the most closed-minded person ever, and then we meet him years later, and they're all loving. God is unconditional love. We see him, you've changed. No, they haven't. We've changed. Our mind has changed. Everything is a reflection of our consciousness. Everything is a reflection of our of our mind. There is nobody out there that's, that has an independent life of their own that's going through an independent journey. There's nothing apart from us. Everything we perceive is a reflection of what we believe. If you spot it, you got it. If you perceive it, you believe it. That's just the way the law of, as you sow, so shall you reap. You could call it karma, you can call it anything you want from any tradition. Well, all that I give is given to myself. Giving and receiving are the same. It's all mirroring. It's all one mind. And so, that's what we have to remember, because I did accept that invitation. And I went there, and there was this minister, and he said, I have to go visit this other minister who has cancer. I leave my flock to you. Ooh, the old church, the ministers just walked out and left me alone with the flock. <laughs> what did I talk about? Sin is real. Death is real. God didn't create the world. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to change my talk. <laughs> the minister left. The Oprah Winfrey minister left. <laughs> he was just there to get me in the door. And then, as I'm there, and I'm giving this talk, my the biological mother, from my earth mother, showed up. She was there in the audience. My biological sister, my earth sister was there. My biological father was there. It was the bio biological father that had invited, had gone to the minister who was teaching a class in mysticism at a traditional Christian church. Of course, he'd gone through the, you know, NDEs and everything. He was teaching a class in mysticism, and my biological father had gone to the class, looked at all the books, and those they were studying the lives of the saints in, in this Christian, the Christian saints you know, in, in this mysticism class. And he was talking, and they were reading, you know, St. Teresa of Avila, and St. Francis, Mother Teresa, you know, the saints, St. Saint John of the Cross, and da, da 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 And then my biological father says, uh, can I invite my son to come to this class? The guy said, sure, it's an open class, anybody can come. And then the biological father said to the minister, well, actually he's one of them. The minister said, one of what? One of them that we're studying about. The minister, this is the Oprah Winfrey minister. What are you talking about? 
We're talking about the saints, because, yeah, he's one of them. And so, the minister said, well, that's where the invitation came from. Instigated by the biological father to come to the church after I've gone through the whole transformation. And so, it was almost starting to head towards one of these biblical things, like, who do you say? that I am. So, I go back to the old church, minister invites me in, goes off to visit this other minister with cancer. I've got the group there, biological family, right there, group. And, and I looked, and the biological father, he was smiling. <laughs> he was smiling. And the biological mother, she looked a little disoriented. <laughs> Probably like Mary looked when Jesus started, when it's before Abraham uh, was, I am stuff, and Mary's probably going, damn, what did I do wrong <laughs> that my son would talk like that? Woe to you Pharisees and scribes. <laughs> did you bring the loaf of bread that I asked for? <laughs> I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but for me. <laughs> what did I do? I rest in. I kind of, I kind of, you know, so here I am. Let's get back to the church. The biological father is smiling. The biological mother is disoriented, <laughs> to say the least. And the biological sister looks frightened. Actually looks frightened. Her face is almost like, who is this guy? What? David doesn't speak, ever, ever speak like this. What is happening? This is what is going to happen as you answer the call. You have got to let go of past associations to accept the innocence of who you really are. People aren't really people. People are just thoughts. And to the extent that those people reflect the love and joy and happiness in your mind, you should welcome those witnesses, because those people are being used by Jesus and the Holy Spirit to witness to your truth. And what about the naysayers? What about the people that say, you've, you've gone insane? <laughs> I've followed my heart. I got happier and happier, more joyful, more and more happy, more joyful in my life. Sometimes people would say, David's not himself. David's beside himself. They used to say that about Jesus back in the day. He's beside himself. Imagine Mary trying to explain, well, he's a little beside himself. <laughs> I, I've heard through the grapevine, Cajun people will say, David doesn't have all of his marbles. David has lost his marbles. You better believe I've lost my marbles. <laughs> Those hard rocks <laughs> of judgment <laughs> and grievances are long gone. I have lost my marbles. I'm happily, happily lost my marbles. To be in alignment with spirit, I am happy to let the past go. So when we are ready to follow the Lord and say yes to the call, we have to be willing to lay everything in our mind on the altar. And say, all we're really doing is saying to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you use it. If I have children, I put them on the altar. I say, Holy Spirit, you know the best use of my children. You know the best use if I have a house, if I have funds, if I have a debt. That, isn't that wonderful that we can give a debt to the Holy Spirit? Isn't that the coolest thing? Why don't the, the, the money managers, the counselors, our financial counselors, Tell us that we can give the debt to Jesus. How many <laughs> counselors here can you go to in Dallas? There probably are some. But if you go in there and you say, I have a student loan or I have a credit card debt or whatever, they say, let us pray. Let us give that debt over to Jesus Christ immediately. That's the most effective way, I'll tell you. That, that will handle that debt in the fastest way possible. And I've got plenty of witnesses for that because I've been doing this for 30 years. And that's a common one. I get people that are facing debt. They're facing burdens, responsibilities, duties, obligations. They feel wound into this world 
like quicksand. They feel like their feet. Forget the feet, they're knee deep. They're up to their thighs in quicksand. You see, David, you understand it. The more I move and struggle, the deeper I go in the quicksand. And I said, oh, I totally understand that. I was doing that for the first 27 years of my life. And for the last 32 years, we'll say, I've been following another teacher. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. First 27 years of my life, I was serving the ego. And I had a lot of depression and anxiety and shyness and stuckness to show for it. 27 years of moving in the wrong direction, so to speak, even though it's all working for good. It's, it wasn't, there wasn't, it wasn't very tangible for me. I wasn't joyful. I wasn't vibrant. I wasn't happy. Because I was following the voice of fear. Get more education. Save for a rainy day. You be, don't talk to strangers. You know, all the things a lot of us were raised with, you know. Be careful, be cautious. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. How it's changed. Now I'm staying with host, with jolly and happy. That's not dog-eat-dog, -dog. that's happy, happy, happy. I was singing some kind of song, I forget what I was singing. It was something about happy and jolly. Oh yeah, because it's all the Christmas lights in here. I, I go to the house, Lisa and Peter are hosting this, and the two dogs are happy and jolly. You've met them. Mm -hmm. and, and this last night Jesus is singing to me in my mind, so I'm kind of going around, going in my room. Have a jolly, happy Christmas. <laughs> It's the best time of the year. Oh my golly, have a happy jolly. Oh my golly, have a happy jolly. Oh my golly, have a happy jolly Christmas this year. That's the name of the dogs. That's what I'm saying. But the beautiful snowy covered tree that's there all year round, it was a symbol. Jesus was playing in my mind. As he always is playing, always singing happy songs, always incorporating whatever is around me in the happiest of tunes. Sing a happy tune. The Bible says, make a joyful noise for, for the Lord. Make a joyful noise. When we follow, when we say yes to the Spirit's plan, joy is the thing that comes into our state of mind. That's, that's our, what's in our awareness, is the joy. It's always there. But if we choose to resist, not yet, Lord, I'm not ready yet. Da, 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 da. Those are the biggest those are the biggest blocks. Putting Jesus on the timeline instead of saying, Okay, if you're calling me, there must be a reason you're calling me, because you are the first one to complete your part of the atonement, and you're in charge of the whole plan for the whole cosmos. So when the the boss, <laughs> when the one who's orchestrating time and space all for us, says, I'm calling you now, then the only reasonable answer is, here I am, Lord, reporting for duty, <laughs> reporting for active duty. He's not asking us to go into war, he's calling us into peace. We're, getting, we're called into active duty for peace of mind, and so we need to be ready to respond with yes. But, that's why you're up here close, because you had a zillion questions, and I've only started on number one. <laughs> but I'm ready for the rest. <laughs> uh, well, I say that I love my kids, which I do, but um, I get so irritated so easily by them, especially with a little one. Of course, I don't scream. Because, but I can feel it inside of me, like wanting to, like, open the door and just, like, run away, like, like leave me alone. And um, I just don't know where that's coming from. Why I get so irritated so fast with this little one? I feel guilty, like guilt comes up because I'm feeling this way. And um, I don't know. I feel like I should not be feeling that. 
Um, if I say I love him. Um, that was my other question. Like, because you started talking about discipline. Um, the night we were having dinner. Mm. And yeah. you just spoke about it a little bit. And I guess I don't really know how to discipline my kids. Because they get away with a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Because um, I just don't know how to do it. And I've had a discussion with my daughter where like, I've told her, you know, I'm doing the best I can. I don't know how to be a mom. There's not a book. I just don't know. I'm doing the best I can. But I get a lot of um, judgment from my family, from my in-laws, and everybody that I'm not doing enough of a good job with my kids. So I guess I'm asking for help on how do I discipline my kids? How do I, when I feel this irritation, how do, how do I go deeper into, like, I want to heal that. I just don't know how. So yeah. I don't know if anyone else here has yeah. kids. But. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. Let's go into that because, because the ego has a plan of forgiveness. And the ego's plan of forgiveness is if something were different in this world, if someone acted different, if something changed in the world of form, I would be happy. And then the Holy Spirit has a plan of forgiveness. If I change my mind, I change my purpose, if I change my perspective, I would be happy. So we have two plans of forgiveness. One from the ego, the death wish, that actually wants us to stay guilty, and that's that voice in your mind that wants to say, it wants you to conclude something about your identity. For example, it wants you to conclude, I'm a bad mom. Because if you conclude, I'm a bad mom, then guess what it's going to throw heaps on top of that? Guilt. And it wants to hit you so stuck in guilt that you won't even think about escaping from this world. It wants you to conclude, perhaps other people have said it, perhaps you've had the thoughts of, of I don't know how to be a mom. They're getting away with a lot of things that maybe they shouldn't be getting away with. I don't have how to discipline. So those are all his thoughts. And then the ego comes in with, and it's because I'm a bad mom. And if you accept that, then you accept the guilt that comes with that. Now the Holy Spirit is going to say, we have to use everything in the world that comes up to, as a starting point for forgiveness. So why don't we take your youngest, and why don't we take a specific situation where you start to feel that, like you just want to run out the door when you're perceiving this specific situation, because this was given to me today from my Levels of Mind, uh, levelsofmind.com, and also it's in a couple of the books, and it's online. There's a, there's a worksheet called Instrument for Peace that kind of goes with this, but this is like the metaphysics of, that Jesus gave me of what's going on in our minds. And it's the desire is at the center. You know, when I talk about wanting, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When we were talking about our desires and multiple desires, that's at the center. And then right outside the, the, the core, which is desire, is belief. So the ego is a belief. If, if you have a desire for anything, you can bet that a, a belief will spring from it. Like in A Course in Miracles, Jesus said, truth will be returned to your awareness by your desire, as it was lost by your desire for something else. That's the line from the Course. Let me use another word, maybe you put another word, I'm down there in the Bible Belt, so I'm going to substitute, Jesus likes to substitute words, he loves to use synonyms. Let's use prayer instead of desire. Truth will be returned to your awareness by your prayers, as it was lost to your awareness by your prayers for something else. Maybe you had a strange, weird prayer one time. What if there's more than everything? What if there's more than heaven? That's a strange prayer. Believe me, it's a strange prayer. But that's how the ego seemed to arise. 
from this sense of more. What if there's more? What if, okay, I'm a perfect child of God. What if there's more? That's, that's what the, the ego belief seemed, not in reality, but seemed to arise from a belief, could I have more? You know how that goes with your parents when you, when you're a kid, and you start asking for more, and then there's a little struggle that usually comes and you want more, and more, and more, more allowance, more chocolate, more popcorn, more playtime, more, 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 until finally the, the iron hand comes down and says, stop! <laughs> That's not attractive. You're always asking for more. So outside of desire is beliefs, then outside of beliefs are thoughts, outside of thoughts are our emotions, and here, where the little character is on top, the little human being, that's perception. The body is part of the perception of the world, a fragmented perception of the world. So let's start at the top, because we, we have to do that. Okay. We have to, we have to, it has to be told this way, we have to start where we perceive ourselves, because we, we have to work our way in, because we're unaware of at the core. If we, if we were aware of the core, it would be a quick shot back to God. <laughs> oh, here's the holy instant. I desire the holy instant. This holy instant, when I give to you, you know, all the things in the course, that's the quick shot. I need to do nothing, all that stuff comes right in here. So, let's use something specific from something that your your youngest, some action or behavior or scenario or something that just, you notice there's like a, a reaction that comes on the inside. Well, um, I don't know if this can be used, but I see it that happens over and over and over again. I was here yesterday and I received a text from my son. He kept calling me. And then he texted me, and I showed it to Hope, where he's like, Mom, come home. My dad is so mean. He just, and it just happens over and over again, where they just can't get along, and I'm in the middle, and and I don't know what to do. And it's like, I just feel irritated, and yeah, like wanting to run away. Even though I was not home, my son was like crying out, Mom, come save me. I don't want to be with my dad. So, um, and even when I was coming this morning, you know, he's like, Mom, no, please don't, don't leave me with my dad, no. I'm like, oh my goodness, like, I don't know if that can be used. Yeah, oh yeah, that's perfect, because any, any perception, and that's good that you're filling in the details of perception, the, the, the words, the tones of the words, the, the text, all those things, give us all a pretty good picture of the perception. You know, we have to, that's the thing about the spirit and healing, everything is so practical. Jesus wants us to be practical. He just is saying to us, hide nothing from me. Like, be totally, be an open book. Just let it all hang out with me, and I, I will handle things. I will help you clear your mind. I will help you clear your perception. And so, when you start off with that, then it comes down to, it, it's back to this call thing, like, like for you, um, I already discussed yesterday how miraculous it was for Diana and I to come with the invitation uh, to come down here, and, and you were even looking for a room for us, and then, you know, came Peter, found this place, and all the different things. So, so I sense that there's a sense of, Part of you is, is called, was called to come and be here yesterday, and called to come and be here today. And then, it's like, there's, there seems to be this opposing force coming through with these texts, or these words, or whatever, that's kind of saying, don't leave me with him, stay with me, be here. And, and how many of us have felt pulled in a couple two or more directions, where we feel a call to something and then there's something else that seems to be an opposing force <laughs> coming in there and saying, no, 
do this instead. You know, it's like this. This is the definition of a split mind. I call it the committee. Most of us have a committee in there. And the committee meets regularly, and the committee has lots of discussions, and the committee voices, you know, this is schizophrenia, but you know, I, I say that's what the human condition is, it's, it's schizophrenia. You do hear voices in your mind. People say they can't hear the Holy Spirit, but they can hear voices. They say, I can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, but I hear the committee. <laughs> the committee is very active. How are we? It's like Saturday Night Live, point, counterpoint. You know, Jane Curtin and Dan Aykroyd, point, counterpoint. There's this, there's this thing going on where our mind isn't quite sure about what it is or what it's doing, and there's a lot of discussions and well, let's let's divide it to the positives and the negatives, the pros and the cons. If your committee's ever broken it up into the pros and cons, you're contemplating a new relationship. It seems like a big deal. <laughs> Here are the pros. <laughs> this is good. This is good. But can you live with <laughs> this and this? <laughs> These are the cons. You see, this is how the the committee works. So, so really. What we do when we start to practice the Course is we realize that, that our perception of the world has a lot going on underneath it. And you were talking about intense emotions today and the tears coming when you were here. And, and this is usually a feeling of being like, torn in some way, split in some way, so we have conflicting emotions. What this diagram is showing is that there are thoughts under those conflicting emotions. We have joyful, happy, loving emotions, and we have fearful emotions that can take the form of anxiety, guilt, shame, pain, many things. We have conflicting emotions, we have conflicting thoughts, and we, underneath those conflicting thoughts we have a conflicted belief system. If our mind was a computer system, we've got a virus. Our our thought system has been infected with the virus of ego, a virus of scarcity, lack, and guilt. What do you do when your computer has a virus? Clean it. You do. Shut the computer off and clean it. Those are the first two things. I thought somebody was going to recommend me some, uh, some guy on the street corner. But now they're getting I love it. Clean it. Shut the computer off. Shut the computer off is like, be still, and yours is, clean it so that I can know that I'm one with God. You know, that's a good answer. But you can see how we need, to, we need that practice, we need to make that an active practice of stopping, pausing, instead of reacting. And I'm sure you do that, like you say, these are internal, you don't, you don't show every emotion you have, you don't talk out every thought. Um, and that wouldn't even be practical, even if you were part of our community where there's no private thoughts and no people pleasing, if you kept exposing every single thought and emotion you ever had, somebody would say, somebody's got to do the dishes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you go along, practical living things come in, even when you're dealing with all this cauldron of, of emotions. So, I would say that, that as Jesus tells us, all of your problems have already been solved, but it won't help you to tell you that as long as you misdefine the problem. If you know anything about the 12-step program, you know that the 12-step program wouldn't work unless you, if you skipped over that step, that you have to admit that you have a problem, that you have to admit that you are powerless over alcohol or over the situation that you're dealing with. If you just took that out of the 12 steps, do you think those 12 steps would be effective if you just skipped over the admission of the problem? Jesus is saying the same thing in the Course. He's saying, oh, you have a perceptual problem, but until you admit that, until you fully admit that you have a perceptual problem, then you're not going to be able to accept the solution. If you still think you have relationship problems, you're denying 
that is a perceptual problem. If you still have financial problems, you're denying that. If you have physical symptoms or pain, even pain experience around the body or psychologically, and you think it's that psychological problem or that uh, physical problem, anything that you believe is the problem, without first accepting that you have a perceptual problem, is a, is a denial. It's like trying to skip over the direct pathway to the correction. So, like in 12-step programs, they will go around the room and they'll introduce themselves. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. You see how it's so important not to step over the admission of the problem, that they will reinforce that every single time they start a meeting. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. And then they welcome, they all welcome them by name. And that's very important. We have course groups going on all around the world, but why is it that the course groups don't start with, Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I have a perceptual problem? <laughs> they should, because, because that's the one thing you have to admit before you can go for the solution. Usually it's, hi, so-and-so, let's, okay, what chapter are we on, or what we're going to read, whatever, who's going to read first, and this and this, let's get busy, to the busy busyness of reading the book. Or, you take your coat off, and, oh, I've had a rough week, oh, I had a rough day today. My boss. <laughs> da, 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 da. No, you don't have a boss problem. My period. My migraine headache. My stuck in the traffic. My car that broke down. My children that are texting me every hour. My, 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 my. Oh, I, my name is so-and-so and I have a perceptual problem. <laughs> I have a perceptual problem. Yes. Something helpful for me is the second half of that first step. Is, you know, I'm not just powerless. Uh, my life is unmanageable. Yeah. My life has become unmanageable by me in the second step. I can't believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Yeah. Well, those I first two steps, how, where would you be in the 12 steps without this? Three, steps? made a decision to turn our will and our life over the care of God as we understood. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a natural for going in many years, I, you know, work those steps, and they never made more sense to me than they do right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That, that, is the beginning of accepting the call. That's the beginning of, of going for your joy, following your heart, following your happiness, is that admission that the world as it seems to be organized, the world as I perceive it, the linear world of causes and effects, the, the human condition as I seem to have in, invented it. That's one of the workbook lessons of The Course of Miracles. I have invented the world I see. The human condition, as I have invented it, let's even be more specific, the human condition is the ego invented it, as the ego made it up. That's even but more specific. I have to admit that I was wrong about that. That I actually, maybe I'm not convinced I'm wrong, but I hope I was wrong. <laughs> I'd be better off if I were wrong. That's what he says in the Rules for Decision. You would be better off if you were wrong. And some of you remember that part in the Course, would you rather be right or happy? Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about. Would you rather be right-minded and joyful, and, or would you rather be happy? Would you, would you rather be the wrong mind of the way that the world is constructed, or would you rather be right in a new way of looking at the world, is really what it's saying. So, how does that apply with the children? Well. We were talking yesterday about my friend Lisa. Some of you were here, she's the one who was going, was suicidal, and was saying, if you're there, God, you better, you better do something quick, you better show yourself. And then she had this real mystical experience of, like an angelic experience of flashes of light coming to her. Lisa truly believed, truly fly, and then she got fired up and went down and was all happy with her children and everything like this. When I first started to visit Lisa in her house, that's, that was kind of the situation of the house. Uh, 
that you you have a house and you have a husband. Lisa didn't have a husband at that time, but she had two teenagers. And uh, when she invited me into the house, she did say, she said, "I want to I want to cook your your meal. What's your favorite meal?" And I said, hmm, "What's your favorite meal?" She said, "Prime rib." I said, "Good. Let's have a prime rib." So we went right in, but then it was beginning to start to practice the course, practice all of this with her thoughts and feelings, and basically she was doing a juggling act. She was working a job, she was trying to parent her children as a single parent, and she had the sneaky suspicion that, that her parenting had gotten way out of control, like she was not really parenting in the most helpful way, but it was it felt like it was out of her control. The whole house, there was clothes all over the house. She basically would go work her full-time job as she was uh, had a nursing staffing company, come home, go all over the house picking up clothes and cooking meals. She was literally the slave in that dreamscape. And she was burned out, and she was tired, and she couldn't even take the time to do her course lessons and pray and meditate, even though she was being called by God. She was so caught, like caught in the wheel of, of almost like the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz. All of her straw had been taken out from, from inside her and thrown all over the road. And she felt fatigued and irritated and angry and and wondering how do I turn the ship around. So that's what we started doing was, was this kind of a of a worksheet, this kind of a, a teaching uh, on on facing things. So the most important thing is just that spark in your heart, like I am being called by God. I can answer the call. I have the full capability to answer the call. I will succeed in answering this call, because to deny the call is, is that is insanity, that is stark raving insanity, and I will succeed in this call, and just like with my friend Lisa, that, that's been a huge turnaround, I don't know how many years it's been, but 12 years, or 13, 14, I lose track of time, maybe more, but it's been like a very concerted effort at, at healing the mind, like using all of the support that's available, using all of your prayers, and and the biggest temptation initially is, is this feeling of being overwhelmed. That's, that's where it gets to be so conflictual. I had that in my life, in the parable of David, there was one point where I felt, I felt overwhelmed, I felt stressed, I felt stretched, I felt disheartened, I felt empty, I felt sad, I felt like I was hitting like a rock bottom. And then I remember one point where I went and confessed this all to my mother, confessed it all, and said, but I still have hope that I can turn my life around. I made my big confession to my mother, and I said, I still have hope I can turn I remember my mother said, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> well, that's good one, that kind of got me <laughs> fired up a little bit. <laughs> you know, you've got to realize that, that the one you're really confessing it to is the Holy Spirit. Really. That just is a symbol, and that the Holy Spirit is actually never going to tell you it's too late. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will just go, thank you, we needed that, we needed the starting point. It's time to come clean, it's time so to speak it up. Say, it's something inside to say, no it isn't. <laughs> yeah, that, that did come pretty quickly, like, I think it's not too late, yeah. Yes? So you talk about finding your, your joy and you talk about finding your joy and your happiness. Are they, though, veils over the truth? Emotions? 
the, are the, they part of uh, art, joy, and happiness, and emotion? Yes. And Jesus does say, of course, he simplifies it for us, and he says, you have but two emotions, love and fear. So joy and happiness would say, they're derivatives of, of love. And so, those are very important barometers. In other words, if we're going to be drawn up, we'll say, through the tractor beam, we, there's something about this law of attraction, we like to be drawn into love through attractiveness. We don't want to, to be fighting and kicking or or fighting against the darkness. We want to be drawn by the love. And the more we give ourselves over to miracles, which is what A Course in Miracles is about, that's where that happiness, those that's where those loving emotions, the happiness, the joy, come from being a miracle worker. And let's face it, who, who among us here, when we were children, were growing up, that we thought we would be miracle workers? <coughs> that was not something that was at the childhood, uh, the, the dinner table. Eat your peas, eat your carrots. You know, there was no, David, you'll grow up to be a miracle worker, take heart. You know, but eat your peas. You know, there was not, uh, there wasn't any of that. You know, that's, it's quite a startling thing when we start to, to even have an admission that we're here to be miracle workers or teachers of God or whatever terms you want to use. You know, it, you can use any word. It doesn't really matter. We're to be bringers of light, or messengers of love and light, or whatever you want to call it. That's quite an admission, because we've got a lot of programming that's telling us a lot of other things. So we've got to figure out what we're going to be when we grow up, and we better have a plan. You know, with lots of good education, and lots of support, and resources, and finances to follow it up. But when we open to miracles, then yes, those are the, that's how you really know you're, you're flowing in the plan, is by those loving emotions. So in that sense, when I say emotions, the realm there is more like our emotions are like our barometer. And there is one time I remember in A Course in Miracles that Jesus says you you can you can tell how it's going you can tell whether you're lining up with your the presence of God and love he says you can ask yourself how do I feel and and that is a barometer like our feelings are to be used as a barometer to acknowledge that we are following the spirit now I should also say that the ego is very clever and tricky and ingenious, so it has invented a lot of feelings that are not inspired by love. And that's why, even though it's the most basic thing to ask yourself, how do you feel, you really have to have a strong sense of discernment around those feelings. Because you have to start to come to a sense of deep honesty around those feelings. So I'll, I'll talk about that for a second. There's a part in A Course in Miracles where he's saying your perception is so distorted that in this distorted perception, now, which you find yourself right now, you cannot tell the difference between pain and joy. You cannot, in this distorted perception tell the difference between pain and joy. What he's really saying is, if you could tell the difference between pain and joy, all you would experience would be joy. There's some kind of trick going on, some kind of mesmerism, some a very sneaky ego trick that has you attracted to the misery, attracted to the pain, and uh, there's three subsections in the course when you get to the special love, special relationship chapters 15 to 24, where the beginning there where he's basically saying he has three subsections: attraction to guilt, attraction to, to sickness, and attraction to death. Only Jesus author could get 
could write a book to put those as three subsections in a chapter and hope the book will sell. <laughs> Imagine writing a book. Attraction to sickness, attraction to guilt, attraction to death. Attraction to pain, actually, I think it's pain, guilt, and death. Those three. Well, anybody who had an attraction to real pain would love it. <laughs> yeah. That's the obstacles to peace section. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so basically, we do want to use our emotions as barometers, and also we have to really be discerning, because the ego is going to try to mess that up too. It doesn't want us escaping from its, its crazy thought system. When you talk about no no repression, is that would you consider going through that a practical application, or can you elaborate on the practical application of no repression? Yeah, I think a lot of people do use instrument for peace as a way of, of undoing the repression because you know basically as part of the personality self, you know we're taught we have to survive. So if we have traumatic experiences, let's say. We have childhood memories of sexual abuse, or horrific memories of going to school, or abusive situations, bullies, or traumatic experiences with like losing a, a spouse, or losing a parent, or you know, being war experiences. I have people I work with that come from war zones, and they say, hey, David, I've got post-traumatic stress syndrome, and so on and so forth. That, that the mind, you know, it's a survival mechanism, it, it represses and suppresses and pushes, pushes thoughts, beliefs, memories out. And when we talk about decision, for example, um, and we say sickness is a decision, and we say everything really, it, we experience is a decision. In the rules for decision, Jesus says, you're making decisions continually, but there's a lot of decisions that you are not aware of. So he's describing the shadow of the unconscious mind. But we've got, looks like you had a computer program, and you've got a lot of things running, a lot of programs open at the same time, a lot of things running. And then, you're using your computer, and you notice your computer gets slower, and slower, and slower, and then it starts to freeze. And you go, hmm, maybe a virus. There's something going on, but it's, but it's somewhere on your computer. It's not like you know. You may have to do scans. You may have to do a lot of scans and searches to find it. It's very similar to what, what this is all about. It's almost like, let's go inside and, and clean, which is what Peter said. If you have a virus, you need to clean. You need to pause. Turn off your computer and, and have a strategy of, of cleaning. And so, in some sense, uh, that's what we were saying the other day, that Jesus says an untrained mind can accomplish nothing, and he also says you are much too tolerant of mind wandering. Maybe there's a lot of unconscious mind wandering that's going on, and basically, when we're conscious of something, of decisions, that's one thing. When we're not conscious of decisions, they are beliefs. That's what a belief is. The belief is an unconscious decision. It's been pushed out of awareness, so you're operating on it, but you don't see it. It's down there. And most of us were not told in school, okay, Boys and girls, you're going to become Sherlock Holmes, but instead of finding crime, solving crime mysteries, you're going to solve the riddle of your own mind. <laughs> Day one, we're going to get, get our whiteboard out, and we're going to... Here we are in kindergarten, we're going to talk about the levels of mind here in kindergarten. <laughs> you can still have your nap, you can still have your snacks, but we've got to talk about some very important things here. Because you may be tempted to get into fights with your classmates, food fights. You may be tempted to go through all kinds of struggles and project onto your, your classmates and even onto your teacher. That's why we've got this. That, that we have to be in power. We have to start to see we can be proactive about discovering what's going on. And that's, that's a huge part of it.
who's uncovering these things. So would that be like you you actively look within yourself? But it, would you um, take that whatever is happening in your life at that present moment that might be creating an upset as your starting point, or would you try to just continually go deeper and look if you're not in joy? Am I making sense? If I'm not in complete bliss and everything that, or I'm not in joy, feeling that joyful feeling every day, should I actively search what in my you know, what in my belief system is blocking that joy, or would you just wait till Holy Spirit brings it in front of your face to look it's, at? It's kind of a combination. Every time we get upset, the Holy Spirit has already brought it in <laughs> yeah. front of us. He's, he's brought it to our attention. That even when discomfort is introduced, there's there's a plan underneath that, and and the plan is not to keep stuffing it. You know, that's part of the ego's plan of how to deal with upset. Stuff it. And just stuff it, stuff it, stuff it. Almost like if you had a rug, and you just kept cleaning around the rug, and then you just, instead of sweeping it into a dustpan, you just keep lifting up the corner of the rug, and you just keep stuffing the dust and the dirt under the rug, and then the next time you stuff it down there, and you stuff it, pretty soon you have lumps, you start tripping over the carpet, but you can't see the dirt, but you've been sweeping the dirt under the rug. Anybody would tell you that's not a practice. The same thing is in dentistry, if, you know, we can be attracted to sugars, sweets, my grandmother had a sweet tooth, I had a sweet tooth, but, you know, it would have been nice if we had some instructions, <laughs> you know, you can have all these sweets, they taste good, but you have to really keep your teeth clean to take care of your teeth, because if you just keep sweet, sweet, sweets, it will take away the enamel on you. Know, it would be nice if we had an owner's manual as we came in as human beings. So, as soon as we were old enough that our parents sat down and said, let's go over the owner's manual. <laughs> it's time we had to talk. It's not a birds and bees talk. It's a, it's a perception, <laughs> emotion, thoughts, belief, desire talk. That's instead of the birds and bees. We need this before we need sex education. We need this before we consume huge quantities of ice cream <laughs> and and Halloween treats and and candy. I mean, we need. And now that we've got it, we need to to go with it and really use it. So that's what I, I just encourage everybody. And the and the book back there, I'm mind your mind back to God. What that really is is me working with a group of students back in the 1990s where we're working on this kind of thing, tracing it back from the perceptions deeper into the mind with everything. I, I was part of a community where we had children there, people were dealing with job issues, one guy was working at a restaurant, so he was dealing with all of the, the co-workers, and uh, he would come off of work and he would have all this resentment and anger about this busy uh, restaurant and everything like this. And uh, he started talking about it, which was good. But then, um, he made a mistake. He started to go in his restaurant with his co-workers in the kitchen. He tried to teach A Course in Miracles. He was telling his co-workers, you're never upset for the reason you think. Anger is never justified. <laughs> he tried to teach A Course in Miracles in the restaurant kitchen, and it backfired, uh, because at some point when he started to get upset, they started feeding him back <laughs> everything that he was telling him. Ang oh, anger, Keith, uh, anger is never justified. <laughs> and it's just, and children will do this too, if you try to verbally teach them the course, they'll come back with that right at you, <laughs> and it will accelerate the whole thing. But they were saying, Keith, you know, you, you know, there's no reason to be angry, you know, you're, it, it can't be justified and everything. He gets so upset, I think, uh, he finally moved on from that job because it, it, it turned into a wildfire <laughs> with all these private thoughts being shared. So, so it does take a discernment. You have to be very prayerful about applying this. Who to talk to, who has the ears to hear. You know, even Jesus would preface his talks with, for those that have the ears to hear, let them hear. He was very, very prayerful 
in all of his talks and discussions when he taught as well. So we can learn from the way shower. We need to be that humble, that modest, that prayerful, and not try to convince anybody of anything. Because really, our mind is being convinced by the Holy Spirit. That's the important convincing. And we don't need, if, if we keep trying to convince others, we need to start to question that and say, why is it so important to me that they act a certain way, speak a certain way, think a certain way? Of course, with the children too, that's, that's a pretty strong temptation, you know. With parenting, there's, there's the one temptation, laissez-faire, hands off. It's out of my control. They're out of my control. I have no control over the world, and I definitely have no control over these, <laughs> these children. And then there's more of the, where there's a feeling that I need to be speaking and interacting, and I need to say certain things, and maybe I need to set certain guidelines, or encourage, give guidelines, encouragement, is there any time I need to be reinforcing and sharing things? Most parents are dealing with a style of parenting that is, is prevention and prohibition and, and control. Um, that's, they're dealing with a major control issue in the mind and they're dealing with it in terms of their children. So there's a war that, that breaks out at some point during childhood, and that war may go on for the rest of the life. It may start with twos. When you first are saying, oh honey, can you make sure you clean that up? And you get the no, the no word comes for the first time, and then the ego is activated like, well, we got a battle on our hands. We, don't, we do not have a yes, we have a no. We've got a situ- the committee comes in, we've got a situation here. This little two-year-old has pointed the finger right between our eyes and said, no, with some force behind it. What are we going to do? You need Jesus in a big way at that point. Because if you don't follow Jesus, then there's going to be consequences, seeming consequences, that come from believing that there's something outside of you that is contesting your very identity. And that's, that's the authority problem that Jesus is talking about. The belief that you can offer yourself is something that has to be rinsed away, and the children are showing up, playing their part perfectly, as, as asked for. I'm here at your request. You've drawn me here. I'm here to act out in many ways so that we can learn to accept the atonement. And you'll thank me for this. (laughs) At some point, when we come around back to Jesus, you'll thank me for everything that I seem to do. And everything that I seem not to do, you'll thank me for it. So that's that's kind of, that's that's what's really going on. It's It's an undoing of an authority problem. Might be ready for a break.